Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Manuela Hirschmogel. Dr. Hirschmogel is a tenure track professor at the University of Graz and a senior scientist at Johannan Research, both in Graz, Austria. Her background is in environmental sciences, and she has a PhD in remote sensing from the Graz University of Technology. She has been working on a variety of different national and international projects in forest and vegetation monitoring on various scales. These projects included EU-funded grants, international development grants, and technology development for the European Space Agency. Dr. Hirschmogel is now a visiting professor at UBC uh, in Dr. Bianca Eskelson's lab. Her main research interests are in vegetation and forest monitoring using different remote sensing sensors and techniques. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hirschmogel. Thank you. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Does everything work? Can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. So um, yeah, nice to be here today. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, and while thanking, I also want to thank my co-authors and colleagues, um, as this has been a group effort. And I would like to thank everyone who uh, um, gave their input and uh, worked with me on that topics. Okay. Now it's not working. Okay. Worked before. Okay. Interesting. Let me see. Yeah, now it works. Okay, it just needed one. Sorry about that. So um, when thanking everyone, I also want to thank, um, as you already <laughs> did it, I also want to thank the Mastram people, which I understood we are here all guests today. I'd like to thank UBC for having me as the guest researcher here, and especially Bianca for being such a terrific host. Uh, I'd like to thank my home university for um, granting this sabbatical and also my family who joined me in being here. Now let's start. What have I prepared for today? Um, this is, um, first, I want to say a few words about the state of forest of the forest in Europe, um, about some issues we have uh, with forestry and the policies we have in place or we are putting in place at the moment, and what are the monitoring needs in order to um, fulfill this uh, the, or to reach these, these policies to have an impact. Um, then I want to come to my main two topics, structure and change, I named them. So first I would like to talk a bit on forest structure and how can we uh, map forest structure from different remote sensing data, especially LIDAR data and in combination with satellite sentinel data. And then I come to the second part about change. How can we map change in an automatized and fast manner? And then give some conclusions. And I want to finalize with some options for collaboration, which I hope we can do together. OK, so um, you might or might not know for Europe's forests are expanding. So we have gained uh, about 9% uh, of forest area in the last 30 years. Um, as you can see from, from the graph here. Uh, so this is one a reason for also a growing stock, um, but not the only one. So currently we have about 40% uh, forest area in uh, Europe for the EU 28 at least. Uh, but the forest area is not the only reason for the, uh, for the in uh, for the growth, it's also an improved net annual increment and increase. Um, there has been some um, discussions on that, on the reasons for that. So now most uh, researchers are 
on, on the position that there are different reasons in, in conjunction. It might be forced management is one of them, nitrogen uh, reposition, then we have an increased uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration that might be a reason. And of course, climate change, we have a warming and this uh, improves the growth conditions. Um, on the other hand, the wood production has been relatively stable over the, the last years or decades. And so that means that we have currently in Europe, uh, forests are a carbon sink, which is a good news. Um, but on the other hand, forest area and carbon is not the only thing we should think about when we talk about forests, because forests have a multitude of functions, a lot of ecosystem services to offer. And if we only talk about forest area and carbon, it's not, it's not enough. So when we uh, talk about, especially I'm coming from Austria, which is a very mountainous country, we have to look into um, avalanche control, uh, erosion control, where forests play a significant role. Um, the sustaining of biodiversity is very important and becoming increasingly important as we see that the, uh, the biodiversity is declining worldwide. Um, and also other things like the provision of opportunities for recreation. And you can imagine that if you are in such a forest like this, forest, the plantation forest, it cannot fulfill the same uh, functional or uh, services as a uh, old growth forest, for example. So this is also what we see in this graph here, that the age uh, has declined since the 50s at least. And what we see here is um, and that we have a lot of even-aged forests. And even-aged forests, often even um, like plantations or spruce-dominated stands that are also very uh, prone to damages from storms, because all the forests have the same height, so um, there is no good structure. And also in terms of um, like bark beetles, it's much more prone to, to these kind of damages. Um, when we look a bit in the statistics, um, this is a statistic for the state of forest from, um, the, this, this is a figure from 2015. And when we look uh, into the Southwest of Europe, we already see a very, very high percentage of damages from insects and diseases. And this was in 2015, this was even before the, the 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 drought years that that came after um so we already have a big share of, of damages here and when we look this is now an example for germany because we're doing a project there too um and we see in 2015 we had still a bit of a third of the crowns were totally healthy uh, and when we look now at 21 it's it has decreased down to 21 percent so we have really a problem, especially in Western, Central Western Europe. Uh, and this is mainly bark beetle due to these even aged spruce dominated stands that we have been uh, maintaining or building or planting over the last like 100 or 150 years. Okay, so um, what policies do we have in place um, now to, to, to tackle these, these challenges? Um, probably you know this, this global um, uh, policy is like that we are now in the decade of, uh, of restoration, of ecosystem restoration. Um, the UN has proposed this, um, this decade and that um, ecosystems that are degraded to a certain extent, they should be restored to uh, fully function. And this also, of course, uh, in forests are also a very important ecosystem in that. I don't think I have to talk a lot about climate agreements. We all know um, like the Paris Agreement and the importance of, of halting or, or slowing down at this climate change. And then there is also the policy on land degradation neutrality. That means that we should not uh, degrade more land that we can restore. Ideally, we should restore more than we, can, than we have than we degrade. On the EU side, we have some specific uh, policies. The biodiversity strategy is a very important document that is guiding a lot of the grants as well. So uh, biodiversity is a big issue in, uh, or has become a big issue over the last like, two years. And we have two new proposals for EU regulation. One is also in the same, um, like the UN is on, on nature restoration. 
and the other one is on deforestation free commodities that means that we that the industry who brings in uh, let's say coffee on the European market has to prove that this coffee is not causing deforestation anywhere in the world so this is some some new regulations and they are um, all related in some way to forest and forest monitoring. Um, here is the EU forest strategy 2030. This is also a lot of passwords, of course, uh, like in this policy, this always the situation, but I want to highlight a few of them nonetheless, because they are very important um, that we have to, that it's now not only about carbon, like it has been like 10 years ago, but it's really about the functionality of forest ecosystems. And it also mentions, I want to uh, say here that um, we need to step up the implementation and enforce the regulations. And when we want to enforce something, we need data. So we need good forest monitoring. We need good data collection, reliable data that we can really um, do, enforce that what the policies ask for, because otherwise we have a lot of regulations and nobody cares about it because we cannot prove it either way. Uh, so what do we need in terms of monitoring? Monitoring the forest is, um, we need measurable indicators because if we don't, we cannot measure it, it's, it's toothless. Uh, and it, it should be more than just forest area. Um, the tools should be cost efficient um, because um, just an example in, in, in Austria, we have the protected lands and they are monitored in situ. So people go there and see if everything is still as it should be and that there are no negative trends. And it takes 10 years for this assessment. So after 10 years, you get a report and says that 10 years ago, there was some problem. <laughs> so what's the point? So we need really uh, to be quick and cost efficient in, in, in our monitoring. Of course, the monitoring system should be transparent so that there is no fraud. Uh, it should be reliable. It should be accurate, or at least we should know the accuracy. That's also something, I mean, if we know uh, the accuracy levels, we can assess how, how well to trust them. And also um, when we, what we have been doing in the past is the, like statistics sampling, we do sample plots and add up statistics. And then we have also very good uh, monitoring, but um, we don't know about the local implementation. We don't know what's going on. Is there a leakage from, this side to this. So that all sounds like a wish list for Santa Claus. <laughs> so of course we know we cannot probably fulfill everything, but uh, we think that um, combining remote sensing and in situ observations is a, is a good way to go um, in, this, in this direction. Uh, we did also some uh, user study and uh, I don't want to due to time constraints, uh, go into all the details, but I just want to um, alert you to the thematic products that were asked by the users. And we are already here now, again, in this change and structure part. So we, what, what is needed is forest area and change maps, disturbance, including the agents. And what is causing this disturbance? Is it a storm? Is it the bark beetle? Is it a, 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 just the use of the forest? cannot be high because it's always important in combination in order to see how much biomass, how much carbon is there. Um, canopy cover, of course, is also linked to biomass and vertical structure uh, is very heavily linked with biodiversity. So, um, okay, let's look at the structure parameter first. So when we talk about structure, what do we mean by it? There's a lot uh, in this term structure that can be considered structural information. Um, it's like you see here, it's the, um, when you look from above, so it's the tree uh, on, this, on this plot here. Where are the trees? How are they clustered? How dense are they? Um, it could be some vegetation indices that are here um, depicted in different like green colors or the height. So if you have a distribution of height, you have high trees, you have low trees, the gaps are, uh, you have, how are the gaps distributed? Are there deep gaps or shallow gaps? Cannot be cover fraction, et cetera. And then uh, this is more, let's say the easier part, but then what, you, what we want also to see is what is 
beneath the canopy. So for example, if you have a tree that's here and then do we have branches all the way down or do we have like here, we have a lot of small trees underneath that makes a big difference for forest management as well as for biodiversity. So when we want to look into this vertical parameter, like number of layers uh, or the vertical distribution of the branches of the material, the leaf material, um, it's what, what we need is really a measurement that goes into the forest in terms of remote sensing, that's laser scanning or LIDAR data. So this is just an example. And probably you all have heard about LIDAR data. I was not sure. I will just very quickly explain. So LIDAR or laser scanning data is an active system. So the, uh, the sensor sends out a pulse and it measures the time until the pulse returns. And with this, um, with this um, time um, measurement and the information on the sensor, where the sensor is exactly, you can measure the time and back and you can know where exactly this return has happened and what distance. So you can do that from different platforms. You can do that in the forest with the terrestrial laser scanner and measure around. So you can uh, measure all the individual stamps around you. You can do it from a drone, from an airplane, like a higher or lower flying one. And you can also do that from, from space. So from satellite or from, uh, from the International Space Station that we have also, or we have had in the last two years, a sensor there. Um, there are different uh, laser scan types. I'm not go into detail, but what might be important is that, as I said before, when you uh, send out the signal, you get a return. You can get the return only from the top of the canopy. So it's one, one return. You can get, uh, but the, the signal is also able to penetrate the crown. So you can see, let's say, through the forest all the way down to the, to the forest floor. So you get another return here. So you can measure the height of the vegetation. And you can have multiple returns or you can have even the full waveform, how it's called here, so that you know how much do you get in the different layers, in the different vertical layers. And then you can um, deduct back some information on structural parameters from that. Okay, let's first have a look at ALS data, airborne laser scanning. Um, this has been around for quite a while and this is already quite operational. So what we have done at your Neum is a forest atlas or forestry, uh, digital forest atlas for, for the whole province of Styria, about 1 million hectares of forest area, probably not so much in, 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 when you think about Canada, but for us, it's quite a large area and it can, could be extended. Uh, so we processed uh, almost 7 million segments and then calculated it for every, um, every one of the, of the segments. Uh, I can show you quickly um, this kind of atlas, what it looks like. Maybe. Okay. Just have an, a feeling on how we have different parameter here, like the dominant height. And you can zoom in in every area and you get your information. Um, color coded, so you get the canopy cover, you get the um, the age, uh, the assessed age, and the different species, and also the dominant height and an estimation of the timber volume. So this is some uh, like operational project that's already out there. Okay, um, some more complex parameters, uh, which is more research oriented now is that we, when we have these, these laser scanning point clouds, we can slice them down in vertical layers and we can try to get the crown base height, for example. So this is, uh, an animation when you look into uh, vertical slices and you can see nicely the star-shaped spruces here and you go down down one meter steps down and you can see where the crown uh, eventually ends and uh, you see the highest trees start up first and then the lower trees come later and you can 
really see also beneath the highest uh, levels of the of the of the canopy and you can also see smaller trees what you can do with these slices you can um, map out also the small trees as you can see here there's not only the big trees but there's also small trees underneath and of course nowadays everyone is doing ai so we of course also did some ai projects and what we did was to uh, generate this kind of ground truth for some patches and then we modeled this uh, with the with the yolo model this is some kind of a um, you only look once it means um, I'm not a big expert on, on AI, but I know the basics. And what we did was uh, to detect based on this uh, training data to try to detect large and smaller trees with different um, uh, AI uh, deep, deep learning approaches. And the problem is that you cannot just use one of these units, maybe someone of you is familiar with these units, because you need instances. So it's, just, it's not enough to know there is a tree because when you look at the forest, all is tree. So you need to know where one tree ends and another begins. And that's the, the critical thing. And if you're interested in there is a paper out there. That. Now let's have a look on space-borne uh, laser scanning. Um, that's what I mentioned before. So when we look, we can go further up. So um, this one, this JEDI system is uh, an American system, which um, is, as I said, based on the ESS. It's a uh, photon counting laser scanner, and it um, covers the Earth between 52 north and south, as you can see here. Uh, unfortunately, not further north because, um, because the ISS doesn't go over the poles. And what we have here is, of course, not this high resolution that you get many, many uh, returns from, from per square meter, but you have only one um, pulse which has on the ground about 20 feet, 25 meters, and, but you get the full waveform. So what you get for this like cylinder is how many returns come here from the ground. So you can deduct the ground. How many returns come from the different height levels? We have seen the slides before from these different height levels. And then you, we can deduct different like relative heights as here or also other parameters I will show uh, soon. From this JEDI, um, I don't want to bore you with more details. It's just um, what we, we have looked at is canopy height, canopy cover, some structural parameters, and also some biomass issues. Um, when we did this assessment for JEDI in the project, we had um, a national park in the central part of Austria, which is very, very steep terrain. Uh, old growth beach forests, um, which are actually a UNESCO natural heritage site. And yeah, there we did our assessments and compared them to the ALS data. What you see here is canopy height comparing the JEDI data with ALS data. So we, we consider the ALS, as we have seen before, this operational product. Uh, as the truth, although we know there's also some errors, but this is quite close. Uh, to, and we compare that to JEDA. So we have here the ALS height and here the JEDA height, and you see there's still a lot of variation here. Um, we thought maybe this is a problem of the geolocation of the JEDA plots. Um, so we applied this geolocation improvement strategy by Hancock. Uh, it improved a little bit, but still not so much. And so what we looked here and we see that the errors in height uh, are very big as soon as the slopes are steep. So what we can deduct is that Cheddar is very good for, let's say, up to 15, 20 degree slope. We get quite good accuracies, but if, the, if it is very steep, it's coming a bit problem. Um, this is essentially the same as we've seen before. We just had a look also on the density of the forest. So when we take all forest areas and here are the slope classes again, or if we take only the very dense forests, and what we see is that the RMSC is smaller when we have all the dense forests only, but uh, also the R square goes down. So it's a bit of a, a not so clear uh, result, uh, but in general, we can say that JEDI overestimates low canopies, underestimates high canopies, so it's kind of a leveling out. 
um, we see that deep slopes are less accurate. And generally, this is also in line with some previous findings um, that I have shown. The next, we looked at the, the canopy cover or canopy closure. Um, and also, again, here is a comparison. These, these uh, circles are now, again, our 24 meter Jedi plots where we get one information. And uh, here is, uh, this is calculated from ALS and here is calculated from Jedi. And we get some re quite weird uh, results from Jedi. Um, they're not really fitting even after the geolocation has been improved. Um, so this is what we, what we get when we plot all the, the, uh, all the Jedi plots that we have here. Uh, again, we looked, uh, maybe it's the slope. And if we take only the, the very the relative flat areas, it gets better, but we don't have many, many plots left. So what we did only not even 400 plots here. So what we did was we compared it to um, some visually interpreted canopy cover plots. We had more than 200 here all over Austria, where there are, there are steep and, and flat areas and wanted to see if the canopy cover would be better here, but we can see that Jeddah is also very off. So and not even only in the steep slopes, but in all, all the slope um, parts. So I would say Jedi for canopy cover is not a good option. Now let's look into the uh, most exciting stuff from this Jedi is the waveform. So we, as I said before, um, remote sensing is a great tool, but you need to know what you can see there. So you need to be also in the forest to see, uh, to, to understand the signals that you get. And this is what we did here. These are some, some examples of these Jedi plots. In Jedi, what you get is this black curve. In blue are the ALS returns, so the slices again, the percentage of the returns from the ALS, and what we see in, in reality is here. And what we can see is that reality is quite nicely depicted. So it's a relatively a one-layered stand, relatively low structure, and this is also nicely depicted. In this. this is another one, which is more complex. We have smaller trees, we have a lot of undergrowth, um, and this is also nicely shown in both the ALS and also the JLA. So what we did was um, we went into the forest and we kind of um, trained ourselves to understand the, 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 the waveforms. And then we interpreted the waveforms. This is another example. And we interpreted this waveforms, uh, a random selection. And this is then uh, used as the ground truth to compare with our uh, assessments. And this is some result. Um, this uh, FHD is the foliage height diversity. It's an index, quite old index, um, which has been used for biodiversity issues. And it's, it's, it's relatively simple. You just add up the, local, the natural logarithm of the, of the layers. And, you can, and what we can see is here that we have this low uh, vertical structural parameters that they are depicted by low FHD values and the, on the other hand, the high one. Here is again ALS and here is the Jedi. So what we can see in comparison that ALS is a bit more distinct, but both data sets, they have some, um, they have some, some meaning and some uh, information. But now, so far, what we have seen is all, when we talk about Jedi, it's all only on the plot. So this 25 meter plot we have here, and we know something. But what we want to do, if you think back on my requirements, on my wish list, we wanted to have it wall to wall. So we want to have every area covered. So what can we do to do so? So as I said before, we have these plots. We have for each plot information, uh, but we want to convert it to a wall to wall so that we have every area we have an information. Um, what we use is um, the Sentinels, that are the two uh, satellites, or more satellites, but the Sentinel program is the Copernicus program, the European Space Agency's like flagship program for Earth observation. And we use um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. 
Sentinel-2 is similar to Landsat, probably you all know Landsat and Sentinel. Sentinel-2 has uh, 13 bands, ten, uh, four bands in 10 meter resolution. Then we have six bands in 20 meter resolution covering the um, near infrared, red edge and short wave infrared bands. And then there are three bands in 60 meter, which we didn't use for this study. because It's, it's more for atmospheric uh, issues. And the nice thing about Sentinel-2 is that it has a five-day revisit rate. So every point on Earth is covered every five days. And this is just, just the spectral resolution again. So when we use, so we can use this one. And what we did was to process the Sentinel-2 data um, for the different bands and for a large variety of uh, in integers and calculated also temporal statistics. So I think altogether it was something like 160 um, here. And then we also included Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 is a radar satellite. It's an active satellite. Um, that's the, the, the good thing about radar, or yeah, more good things about radar, but one good thing about radar is it can penetrate clouds. So when there are clouds, Sentinel-2 cannot see anything. But if Sentinel-1 can see through, and the second thing, nice thing about radar is that uh, the radar signal also penetrates the crown, like we've seen before with the lidar. So you can get some structural information as well. So Sentinel-1 is a C-band radar. Um, it has dual polarization, so we get um, cross and co-polarization features. And we have currently, so it was supposed to also be a five days revisit rate, but unfortunately Sentinel-1C has failed about a year ago and we have currently only 10 days. So we also process this kind of data. Um, I will not go into detail and altogether we had done more than 220 um, bands and we merged them with the JEDI data, with the plots you remember that we had before. So for these plots, we know structural information and then we did a random forest regression um, we did stratified sampling so to ensure that all the classes are covered. And um, what we get here is uh, this is the FHD, which I showed before, this index, uh, comparing what we had in the JEDA data and what is the, the random forest result. And what we still have a problem here is that we have all get a very high values generally. So because this is a national park and all the values are quite high, so we need to expand this work here to the lower end a little bit to get a, um, a better correlation. So that's something that's ongoing, let's say. Um, another interesting result that we found because many people, at least at the remote sensing conferences, they always say, oh, okay, what do you do with Sentinel-1? That's so raw. Uh, but from the five most important features that we found, there were two from the Sentinel-1, so from the radar satellite. So it, it, it seems that it's really the case that the, the radar gives an added value and not only the, the optical data. Okay, so this is um, just some more results that when you use all features, it's the best result and um, the mean deviation is 0 0.2 uh, FHD values and when you uh, look back or uh, remember this one plot where we had the different classes, these were about uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 apart. So it's it's reasonable. It's not ex very good, but it's. And how do the results look like? Um, this is the, an example. So we see again our plots here, our Jedi plots, and then the world war result that we can uh, generate and that we have a structural information from for every. Another example. So, and with that, I'd like already beaten up a lot of the time. I'd like to also switch now to change since we are already talking about Sentinel. Um, so, for the change, um, I said before that we have a lot of problems with park people in uh, Austria and Germany as well. And this is just an example where um, between 2017 and 2022, um, how much forest has disappeared in this time. So it's really uh, critical. And 
what uh, we do here is, as I said before, we have a, a visit rate of five days. So we can, use, we could have every five days one image, but of course it's not always because we have clouds. But the good thing is with this time series, we can, uh, well, with, with this dense time series of data, we can build, uh, uh, we can, yeah, we can build this kind of green line, let's say. And with this green line, we can predict what should happen next. So um, if, we, if we look here, we see, okay, there's something going on and there are some outliers, maybe these orange plots are some outliers, but they are not critical. But at some point, we start to get off the expected. Um, and this is the, the expectation that we have that should happen. And this is, um, a uh, time series analysis where you can in near real time detect the change. And you might uh, don't know if you are in time series analysis, there is um, different options like a harmonic um, model where each year would look the same. So if you use such a harmonic model, the problem is that if some year there is a delay in spring because it's very, um, it's very long cold, you would detect changes, although this is just a technological shift. So our system is based on a harmonic model plus a Kalman filter, so it adapts to, this, um, to these changes, and that's why each year looks a bit different uh, in this case. So this is what we developed here. So here it's also um, in more detail, so we get um, this time series model definition, uh, for the model initialization, we have the harmonic model, then the, we predict, and then we update with this Kalman filter to adapt for uh, uh, each year's differences. And then we can um, get these innovations, which uh, give us then, um, and I can, um, these innovations are these, what we saw before in orange, that the further away you are from the expected value, uh, the more likely you have a change. And there is also more details in this, in this paper. And when we uh, process this model, we can nicely see here in these purple colors, you see the, the dead trees, how they spread over time. It's always nice to show this kind of picture because this is, I mean, it's not nice that we have this dieback, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, how you see how much changes here. And in this FNews project, we also had it uh, evaluated. So we didn't do it ourselves. It was done by the federal um, states in, in Germany. And uh, the accuracies are quite good, I'd say. It's overall accuracies um, on every, so for the core area, about 90% over all the years. And you can see that some years are better, some are worse. Um, this has something to do also with uh, if you have long periods of cloud cover, your model gets a bit distracted, let's say, and the quality drops. Uh, we did the same for, for the European Space Agency for Austria, and we had a big, this is now not bug beetle, but a big storm event. So you see this front here that's going over Austria, and we did the detection here, and we could like also detect in very quickly after the storm, you can detect the areas of change. And what the nice thing is, um, when you have this, as I showed before, this forestry atlas, where we had the, the timber volume, the height, the structural parameters, wall to wall, and now we have these changes, we can combine them. So we have the change that we get from this time series analysis, um, and we can combine that with um, the, the, the forestry atlas we, we saw before. So we can estimate how much timber is going to come in, be coming on the market, how much damaged timber, or how much um, structural, how much of which forest type is lost for this, and this we can uh, do relatively fast. So this is some very nice, um, like operational products. But then I'm coming to the conclusions. Um, what I wanted to share with you is uh, today was that the monitoring needs they are very demanding. Um, there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah, especially I think the second point is very, very important because 
Um, I have sometimes the feeling that the policy and the scientists are very far apart. <laughs> so they define some indicators that we cannot measure or we cannot, uh, and th or there's always uh, often a gap. And this is something that we, we should look more into um, and put more effort into that to, to come to the same, to the same page. Um, what we know or what we do is that there is already uh, quite advancement, advanced forest uh, monitoring options with, uh, with remote sensing. With ALS, it's, we get the best results, but of course, ALS is quite expensive and covering large areas. So um, there is also other options like space-based LIDAR, especially in, in flat to moderate terrain. Um, the combination, I'm always fond of combining different sensors, different uh, options like LIDAR and satellite data, uh, satellite uh, image data is very nice. And also the combination of course with in situ data. We need more ground truth data. The problem is that we have in Austria that the national forest inventory is not open. So we cannot use it, although it's, uh, it's really a treasure that's hidden and that only uh, the institute that is deriving this data can use it. And that's really uh, a pity, uh, but we can only work with, with the frame conditions that we have. But this is, this is something I, I'm always pledging to better include ground data. Uh, in terms of time series approaches, we are already in a quite operational stage for this new real time uh, monitoring. Of course, there's always room for improvement. There will always be the um, omission and commission errors that's clear. And what we are currently working a lot, especially my colleagues, are on this different damage agents. So, how can we know is this damage done by a storm? Is it done by bark beetles? Is it a result of a drought? And we try to figure that out also from the time series that we have. And this also feeds back into this a regulation on the deforestation free commodities, which is important because if there's a natural cause of the deforestation in the area where the coffee was produced, of course, it's not the producer's fault to uh, cause that. Okay, so, well, what, what I would like to do put on the screen, so for possible collaborations. Um, just one first thing is very, very concrete. I'm working with a colleague on a paper on agent-based modeling for bark beetle behavior. So if anyone is, is, is very interested in that, please come have a talk. I would, I would be happy to have some expertise there. Um, comparison of different vertical structure parameters, if someone is working on that or Comparing structural parameters in Canada and in Europe would also be highly interesting. Or any other research or teaching cooperation, I'm um, glad to, to, to start on, or any other ideas. So I will be sitting in the biometry lab of Bianca for the next month. So whenever you are around, come and check. Thanks for your attention and open for questions. I work on force. Okay, I work on force health, so I'm interested in these time series that you show that mm -hmm. you know identify these outbreaks. Yeah. Uh, but really, what we want, yeah, what we want is to identify. We would like to know before. Once once it's the, at that point, it's too late, right? You can't do anything. Yeah. So it really, it's early on if you can catch that first little clump that you could go and, and do some, you know, uh, logging or, or any kind of mitigation, that would be the sweet spot. And, and I noticed that there's some points that you called outliers early on. Could that not be some of those kind of um, ground zero of, of the outbreak? Uh, yeah, but this, this has been discussed a lot. And we had some companies that promised that they can do it with drones and they really failed. <laughs> Sorry to say. Oh, oh. Although, I mean, we can detect it with the near infrared earlier than if you see it in the, on the tree. So if the needles turn yellow, 
um, you in the near infrared you see it before that. So that's the, a bit of a head start, let's say. But of course, it's not that far ahead that you can really. It's like it's not so much. And these outliers, I don't think they are really indicating something because this can be just a a, rem rem uh, a rest of a cloud or something. So it's. I mean, of course we can always look closer into that. And if we had reference data, but the problem is that we usually don't have the terrestrial data at this time in order to know what we are looking for or what we should be looking for. So it's a bit of a hand egg problem. But if you had any, any information early on and we, we, could, we could further dig into that. Yeah. So, Please don't expect Murik. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk, Manuela. Um, I was curious, um, when you merged both Sentinel and Jet Jedi, you ended up with a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of metrics that you input into a random forest. Um, why? input all of these and you generally defaulted to putting in raw bands so what was your thought process on kind of like throwing everything in in raw um and how did you like format that um what do you mean by raw um like you didn't have any like indices it looked like a like yeah yeah i had, I had. oh never mind. so there was um well so we had these are all indices oh. I know so see we, that there's lots of indices. <laughs> too much on the slide, I know. <laughs> no, we had all the bands and the indices uh, because we wanted to see what, what which features are most important. So that's what, what came out here. So these were the most important ones, like the red edge band from Sentinel band five, uh, the this texture feature from the cross polarization from Sentinel one, and then also uh, another uh, texture feature from the copolarization and two other indices that were the most important ones. So probably you would get um, like almost to the same accuracy if you reduce a couple of percentages overall when you when you take all bands. But since we already had it processed, it, and the processing power is not such an issue anymore, so why not? So the best result was definitely for all bands, so all features. But uh, when you use only the like 10 best, it's also probably close to the, the result would be very close. Uh, I'm gonna hop on your question there about what you were talking about. Can, can, we, can you go back to that slide? Uh, so, so his question originally was, it would, it would be great to know where these locations are, where these effects are happening beforehand, so we could manage effectively to try to mitigate that. With the remote sensing information that you have, you you have information prior to the event that yeah, yeah. could give you, and then also afterwards about where the location is. So isolating known locations and then analyzing backwards in time through the time series to see like what the trends were and whether there's indications of where, why that could potentially be happening mm -hmm. with all of these other pieces of information. Have you analyzed that at all? Uh, well, yeah, no, maybe not too, not too much. I know what you mean. So the, the, when we have, we have, we know that some damage has occurred now, we can go back and see if we find any, any, any significant changes beforehand. So what we saw uh, in many cases was um, that there was a drought before, but the drought is not necessarily the bug beetle infestation. So what the, the, the trees are um, weakened by the drought, but which, the, the, all trees are weakened by the drought in the area, but then which trees get caught that get the beetle and which don't is very difficult. But of course, what you could do, and this is maybe what you want to say, is um, that you, you get hotspot areas that look here, there is a high risk that something happens. That, that, that's certainly feasible, yeah. And what we also did, um, we also tried to um, have, again, AI-based um, modeling on when you have bug beetle locations, proof ones, 
and you have like the, the information on spruce and information on drought that you predict were most likely the next bark beetle outbreak could be. So it's there, there's also some work on that. That's, that's maybe also the thing, but it's not really like see there's something, the signal tells you bark beetle early or this way. Um, so very interesting. So you, I'm going to tweak on something else that you talked about, which is the, the coffee producers. So I work a lot in low and mid middle income countries um, where capacity is often an issue. And uh, obviously, if you were trying to do it for that, for that policy purpose of deforest, in, essentially imported deforestation, um, you're, you're not talking about doing this in Europe, you're talking about doing this in various parts of the world. So I'm just curious, uh, some sense of what the Capacity constraints might exist globally, especially in low and middle, middle income countries, to implement these kinds of techniques, um, and whether there's any any sort of efforts within uh, your own institution or European Union to sort of do capacity building around. around um, this. Yeah, we work together with Uganda quite a lot in, in, in South Africa because it's a priority country from the Austrian Development Agency, uh, and they produce quite a lot of coffee too and tea. And uh, we had. Um, proposal in with the uh, Makarere University in Kampala for exactly that. Unfortunately, this was turned down. So we'll try again, probably. And what we have in terms of this policy, we have now a project uh, open, um, but it is not so much on uh, capacity building. It's more on uh, building the system to enforce, so like working with the industries, that they can prove um, that their products are deforestation free. But there is a component in that with, it is together with Boku in Vienna and they have a citizen science part in there. So they want to like people jumping around and saying, okay, there is some deforestation going on and they can report that so that we may have some additional input data from the ground. So. But I would love to, to, do, to do something because I've been working in, in Cameroon and in some, some of these areas previously in the red, uh, this reducing emissions from deforestation degradation. Very interesting. Yeah. This is a really fast question, but I, I work on things that would be really affected by the EU regulation on deforestation. I just was wondering if it's widely know, like known in, in the EU by like typical citizens or just folks working on forests would know about this because it would have such big impacts on consumer goods. So. It's a proposal. So it's, it's still a proposal for the regulation. So it's now open for comments and we, ex we have to expect that it will be like leveled down, or I don't know how to see it in English, it will be not as strong as the proposal would be, but because the industry will, will take a lot of pressure to have it a bit more, uh, not so strict. So that's why also many people don't know yet about it, but it's in this phase and it will come, we just don't know at, in which restriction level it will come. And I can forward you the proposal if you want, <laughs> if you're interested. Thank you very much for the presentation, Manuela. My question was when you started your presentation, you not only talked about the accuracy of the systems uh, to be used for uh, identifying the structure and change, but also the cost and being efficient. In terms of the comparison you showed us, they were mainly related to the indicators and comparison of different tools. How about the cost? Uh, can you please talk about uh, the comparison of the cost and the duration of the time we would be able to get the, the data? Um, yeah, that depends very much um, on which system you use. Is this, this ALS-based system, like I showed this, this forestry atlas, um, this was, I think it was about 400,000 euros for the whole, for the whole Syria, for the 1 million hectare, it was actually, I mean, the data was already there for the processing and it, you couldn't do it in situ because you cannot like visit every area. So in this way, it's difficult to compare remote sensing based approaches to 
uh, in situ approaches because it's just a different thing that you get. Um, but uh, of course, cost is always difficult because in some, um, it, it always depends on, on the amount of funds because for someone, I guess it's 10,000 euros is a lot of money for the other one, it's, it's not so much, so it's difficult. Ah, you mean compared to Cheddar? Uh, compared to Cheddar, it's, Cheddar is free, but the, so that's, that's definitely more, so more cost efficient, but it's also less accurate as we have seen. That's, that's clear. And yeah, and ALS is only, if ALS data is available. So the, the good thing about Cheddar is that it has been available for two, two and a half years now, but I believe it has stopped working because the spot on the IS, it has already been prolonged for six months and the spot on ISS is now booked for a different system. So I think it's, but there is another one coming, uh, another, there is ISAT, which is another space-based LIDAR. And there is a new one coming from Japanese uh, space agency, I think. Uh, so there will be other options. Do we have anything from the Zoom? Any questions? So uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for attending the, the seminar. Also, those who joined us through Zoom, I would like to thank our presenter again. Thank you. A lot. Uh, the people who helped us organizing and also setting up the room, my grad students, thank you very much for setting the chair. Sonia from uh, Communication. Uh, communications teams, thanks a lot for uh, the emails and registration. Uh, caring for ordering the launch, bringing it here. Michelle and Frederick and William, thanks a lot for uh, the AV system and helping us with the Zoom. Uh, uh, have a great day. It's sunny and gorgeous. Uh, enjoy the day and thanks again. Thank you.